All right, hey everyone, uh, thanks for logging on. Uh, as a preface for this conference, at some point the food is gonna arrive at the VA, so we're gonna take a quick break at some point. Uh, we don't know what's arriving, it's gonna be some like Tuesday surprise, but it should be good. Uh, otherwise, the conference today is called Trust in Me, the CBC. So we've got two cases, one is pretty short, the other is gonna be a little bit longer, and we're gonna basically uh, reinforce the importance of the CBC. Uh, this will not just be all hematology, in fact, uh, it's gonna cover a lot of different organ systems. Okay, so case number one, a lot of text here, but this is kind of the shorter case. So you've got a 53 year old man admitted a few days ago with recurrent left lower extremity DVT on a Pixaban. He's 100% compliant with a Pixaban, but he came in because he was clotting again. So I took this timeline basically directly from uh, a nice uh, medical student note and resident note, but essentially he gets admitted for a uh, um, uh, tibial plateau fracture back in December. I forgot what that uh, abbreviation meant because it's been a long time since medical. Well, open reduction, internal fixation. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> uh, and a few weeks later, he comes back for a catheter, uh, a few months later, a catheter directed lysis of this clot. That is an unsuccessful procedure. And he basically has a series of unsuccessful procedures until 4-1 when he has a successful thrombectomy. He's discharged on a Pixaban, which he's 100% compliant with. Long story short, he eventually comes back on 4-9 and he again is uh, found to have sluggish flow uh, and a recurrence of that DVT on a Pixaban. So considered a failure of a Pixaban at this point. On 412, he gets another uh, procedure in which has a lytic infusion put into his leg. Uh, lytic infusions infusing TPA and heparin through the sheaths. And he said no additional systemic anticoagulation. Most of us would assume that the case probably ends here. This guy's okay. He has to deal with his uh, you know, symptoms, but no recurrence of the clot. Unfortunately, that does not happen. And on 413, his left lower extremity DVT recurs. So uh, for the group, uh, what is your thought process? Like this man is clotting through everything. And so how do you sort of frame this and what are your thoughts? Natalie, future hematologist, the accelerated pathway to hematology. Uh, what are your thoughts when you hear recurrent clot? Um, I have very little information. Okay, great. So maybe calling heme and being like, is this the one time a hypercoag workup is helpful? Uh, hematology tells you probably not because it won't change management. Uh, anything else you'd be thinking, Natalie, or anyone else in the room? Great. So Bill sort of like right on the right track, which the team was thinking that this man's had so many interventions in the same leg that maybe he just has a setup for ongoing trauma. He's not moving. And maybe like Natalie said, he has some sort of underlying hypercoagulability. And that was the leading assumption for about four days. Uh, Mandy, additional thoughts? No, Mandy like arched her eyebrows. Um, but that's the leading assumption for four days until a CBC returns on 413. And I have highlighted the abnormal values. So that's a 413 CBC, so four days. Um, and what do you guys notice from the CBC? Platelet count is cut in half. Is that, but the platelet count's not abnormal, Bill, because it's not in red and there's no H next to it in uh, CPRS. But yes, the platelet count is cut in half. So what does that make you guys think? Hit. Great. No one ever has hit until they do. Uh, and so does this person have heparin induced thrombocytopenia? So how do you guys uh, think about hit and what's like your next step if you're considering hit? People muttering there's a score. There is, there is a score. Does anyone remember? Uh, Hoda says the four T score, which is great. So the four T score. So if you do your T's, I'll tell you the last T is kind of a cop out. Um, but what's the first T? Great, so thrombocytopenia. So this is the one that you guys uh, honed in on, which is that this platelet count is cut in half, which gives you uh, two points. Uh, what's the next T? Yeah, that one's timing. So basically, are you within five to 10 days of heparin exposure? And if you go back up, uh, if you know anything about, uh, if you've done sort of a team exhortation yet, you'll know that after your internal reduction um, and fixation, you are put on uh, heparin for prophylaxis. 
So this is probably when this man was exposed to heparin. Okay, next T. Thrombosis, great, people are crushing it in the chat. And then the last T I'll tell you is a cop out, which is do you have other causes of thrombocytopenia? Because we need to use the same word twice to make this uh, memorable. Okay, so if you have a high or intermediate probability on your 4T score, you can start treating someone for HIT while you sort of send off your confirmatory testing. So how do we treat people for HIT? Say a louder, Bill. Yeah, so Bill says, A, we're going to stop heparin, which I'm assuming Bill meant. And then he says, we put them on our gatriban, which is a direct thrombin inhibitor. And uh, this person ultimately gets discharged on Fonda Um Unfortunately, his HIT antibody was positive, but his serotonin releasing assay is not back yet. And so when you're thinking about HIT testing, the, um, the kind of process you go through is number one, you send off the HIT antibody which has absolutely horrible positive predictive value. It's about 44% positive predictive value. And so if it's negative, it's helpful. If it's positive, it doesn't mean much unless you've got the right clinical situation. And then you send off what we call like a functional assay. And the functional assay is your serotonin releasing assay or your SRA. And that one takes a few days or weeks to come back, but that's the one that has, it's sort of the gold standard for it. And so in the meantime, you're treating uh, and kind of going from there. Uh, Eva, how did this person end up doing? Uh, yeah, that is a great point. So I picked and chose the two most uh, recognizable CBCs, but Eva's exactly correct. This was an astoundingly good pickup by the team because, like I said, uh, the 152 was not red in CPRS or didn't have an H next to it. So unless you were really looking for this, you were not going to think about it. So nice job by the team. Uh, food is still not here yet, so the villagers are getting restless. Not I was going to say, one of your like, favorite songs that you've done before, Turner yeah, so great point by Dr. McGee. He was texting me about May Turner syndrome during the case. Uh, and just as a, a look into like what chief life is, I don't remember the 4T score. I wrote it down. So I ask you guys to remember it. And I don't even remember it myself. All right. The food is here for the VA. So we are going to take a two minute break and then we are going to resume at about 1215 with the second case of the day. For those that were for those that were wondering, it looks like it's burrito day at the VA. So uh, excellent. Oh, yeah.
All right, so case resumes. So the first uh, CBC abnormality we talked about was the thrombocytopenia, a relative thrombocytopenia for patient one. Patient two is what we're gonna spend the rest of the conference on. So this is a longer case, but has a pretty good CBC abnormality. So uh, here is our uh, triage note from the VAED. Um, and so I'll just read this for our residents in the room who are eating. So a patient comes in with cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, cold, chills, sweats, intermittent chest pain, Friday, he noticed the fatigue, and Saturday, he said his SATs were between 70 to 80s at home. He was using his albuterol nebulizers uh, for his asthma more, has some right-sided chest pain, currently pains on the right side of his chest. We keep describing the chest pain, had a prior COVID positive in May, so this is um, about a year ago at this point, and then his first COVID vaccine was 10 days before admission. His vitals, he's afebrile, heart rate's 91, blood pressure is okay, breathing 20 times per minute, which means we didn't measure that. And he's setting 87% on ambient air, and he gets put on three liters nasal cannula, but overall uh, looks okay. So we're going to work through this case sort of in order of uh, like HPI, past medical history, and kind of go from there. So uh, let's give you guys some HPI right now. So here's his HPI, and I've taken this from uh, notes written by our TMAX residents. So I kind of collated their notes. So this gentleman, I'm going to point out the, the big stuff here. He has asthma, coming in with shortness of breath, wheezing, proletic chest pain, and fever for uh, three days. He says his pulse oximeter at home, basically like we said in the ED, was showing less than 80. But then notably, if you get down to the second paragraph, he says for the last two to three months, he's had worsening asthma symptoms, more frequent inhaler usage. Montelukast and teotropium helped initially, but not for long. Um, and he says that his asthma symptoms started after a, a positive COVID while he was in prison 11 months ago. And he was not hospitalized. He also has a history of allergic rhinitis, um, but no other positive review of systems. So uh, what do you guys make of this HPI? Could I have included more buzzwords, less buzzwords, the same amount of buzzwords? Uh, Megan, what are your thoughts as you're like looking, reading the HPI? Great. That's like a pretty much a perfect way to, to think about this, right? We're not going to make a diagnosis from this history in this case, but sort of narrowing into this is like a subacute pulmonary process, thinking maybe could the heart be involved and just recognizing that he's pretty young, doesn't have too many comorbidities, and he is not on oxygen at home. So nice job. Uh, all right. So past medical history to help clarify some of this. So... He was diagnosed with asthma by the Department of Correction doctors in 2008 based on spirometry. He's never had PFTs. Um, he was uh, incarcerated for 20 years, and so he didn't really see a PCP during that time uh, unless he had acute symptoms. But his asthma symptoms were pretty well controlled until he was uh, released from prison in August of 2020. Other than that, he has depression and GERD. So uh, what do you guys make of this asthma history? Great, so it's sort of an odd diagnosis, right? He got diagnosed with asthma in adulthood. Um, certainly people can, can get diagnosed with asthma in adulthood, but it's an odd diagnosis. Victor says, give me the numbers. Uh, Victor, I do not have the numbers for you. <laughs> I apologize. There are no numbers existing, which is a great question though, um, uh, which is great because Victor's saying like other PFTs and there are no PFTs. So, right, we haven't actually confirmed that this person has asthma, which is a, a kind of a critical uh, part of this case. Okay. All right, and then um, obviously this is a pulmonary case, so we need to sort of go down that social occupational history. And so uh, just throwing out there for the next like 20 seconds, what questions are you gonna ask this person to narrow in their pulmonary history? Great, has he started doing things since leaving prison? I think that's a good way to put that. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. What else? Travel history, Travel history perfect. Occupational history, I like it. Uh, 
Victor, how bad was his COVID in prison? Uh, unclear, he was not hospitalized for it, but he definitely had symptoms. What else? Any animals, great. Is this gonna be the one case where someone has a bird? <laughs> Anything else? Nice. So Manny's getting it like general uh, exposure. So like asbestos, molds, things like that. So I've taken the liberty of showing of kind of collating all of his risk factors, but this is sort of the same template I use when I'm uh, taking a pulmonary history from someone. And this is what uh, one of the pulmonary fellows like said they use. So that's where I got it from. Um, but essentially, um, one of our students asked, had he started doing anything since he left prison? And he did. He started smoking after he left prison and he quit two weeks ago. He quit while he was in prison. Uh, he was incarcerated for 20 years in Sterling and released in August of 2020. He said he's never had TB and he thinks he was tested negative in 2019 or 2020. And then the remainder of his symptoms are essentially unremarkable. He's a construction worker, he wears a mask, and he says importantly that his symptoms are sort of no different uh, regardless of where he is. They're sort of the same throughout the day. Uh, Mandy, you said, hmm. what did you say? Hmm. Well, it makes it less likely like a home or work exposure is doing it. Yeah, great. So this is like not just home or work. And so, right, if you were going down like the hypersensitivity pneumonitis pathway and you're trying to find a, a trigger, he doesn't show us like a classic trigger story because he's like sort of always crappy no matter where he is. Okay. Um, and then Victor uh, says, what type of construction does he do? Good question, Victor. I think it is uh, like concrete pouring, uh, sort of like large scale stuff, but I'm also not entirely sure. Really good question though. Okay, so differential for this guy right now. What do you guys think? He's got this sort of tobacco history, this incarceration history. He's got some symptoms. What do you think? Perfect. Yeah, Megan, Megan uh, I'm going to summarize it briefly, give a really nice answer. She said sort of infection, you have to rule out TB in this guy because of his incarceration history, structural or like an ILD picture, which is great. So this is the basically the exact same thought that I had when I saw this man's social history. And so I thought to myself, like, we always talk about ruling out TB for people who are incarcerated, but I actually realized I've never looked into if it's even how big a risk factor that is in Colorado. Um, because technically the incarceration history is more problematic overseas where people have a higher in, uh, endemic rate of TB. So the Department of Colorado, like the health department publishes statistics basically every year. And this is the statistics they published in 2019 where they basically said, well, what are the risk factors for TB in Colorado? Interestingly enough, like we always talk about TB in our differential, but in 2019, at least there was only like 74 cases in the entire state. Uh, most of those were in the Denver area, so we're bound to see it a little bit more than, say, like uh, Colorado Springs or Grand Junction, but still not very many cases. But their highest risk factors, number one was being a, a part of one of the 30 highest TB burden countries, which I'll show you a graphic in a second, but uh, the U.S. is not one of those countries. The second highest risk factor was diabetes, which we don't often think about, and this sort of falls into that general uh, are you immune suppressed category. But then if you go further down, you see that resident of a correctional facility is only 2%. So of the like 74 cases that we are seeing in our state, like basically less than five of those people have any sort of history of being in a correctional facility. It's not zero, so we still ask the question, but it's definitely, this is definitely a lower number than I anticipated based on how many times I've asked people, have you been in prison or have you been incarcerated? Okay, so what are those 30 TB endemic countries? This is sort of like the biggest thing that we need to ask. This graphic's probably a little hard to see, but you can see all the countries listed at the bottom. But essentially, if you're if you're from one of those 30 countries, that's going to be the greatest risk factor for TB. And that's the risk there is, you know, you were living in a household or exposed to someone who had TB when you were younger or when you were growing up. And so this list is probably important to recognize and important to see to, to just know that if you have a patient, uh, you know, a refugee or someone who's traveling or from one of these countries, your uh, sort of spider sense that this is TB should go up. 
but this gentleman had not left Colorado. Okay, so maybe TB is not as big of a risk factor for, uh, or correctional facility is not as big a risk factor in Colorado as we think it is. All right, so what do you guys want next? Do you want the imaging or do you want the lab? All oh, right, yes, context clues. So here's this gentleman's initial CBC. I have taken the liberty of removing the H's and the L's uh, from CPRS, which they're so nice to give us. Uh, what is the notable abnormality on this person's CBC? There's a lot of muttering. Someone, someone say it louder. Eosinophils, great. And how many uh, eosinophils does this person have in a number that makes sense? In a three digit number, how many does he have? Yeah, 500. So uh, it's easier to think about these in three digit numbers. So he has 500. Um, he has 500 eosinophils. And then if you look up here, he has 6%. So he has a peripheral eosinophilia. Uh, that is the like the notable abnormality uh, on his CBC. So while you're sort of like mulling over what a peripheral eosinophilia should mean or what you can do about it, his chest x-ray comes back and shows you this. So take about 30 seconds, then I'm going to ask one of our interns to give a focused read of this chest x-ray. Mandy says classic asthma. Incorrect. <laughs> All right, some good discussion. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Dom, you're close to the screen, which is unfortunate. Um, what's your focused read of this? That's great. Yeah, that's a good read. So like particular nodular stuff bilaterally. If you guys were going to like venture a guess, what area of the lung, top, middle, or lower, or areas looks most affected? The lower. Okay, great. So yeah, I agree. So maybe the lower looks a little bit more affected. I'd say maybe the middle as well, but the upper lobes like don't look so bad here. Um, so yeah, reticular nodular stuff bilaterally, maybe the lower lobes most affected. Uh, what do you want to do next? CT, great. So we're going to get a CT. This was always going to end in a CT. Uh, so here's the CT. We're going to run through quickly his uh, mediastinal windows. We've talked a lot about identifying lymphadenopathy and identifying effusions. And just call out abnormalities as you see them. This is a CTPE because he had an elevated D dimer as well. Okay, was that a super abnormal CT? Or was that like you didn't see a whole lot? Yeah, so uh, Anita says that was not a super abnormal CT. <laughs> so he has like some lymphadenopathy, but nothing on this was very, very striking. So, right, there must be something else I'm going to show you that is more abnormal, and that is his lung windows. So here is lung windows. So again, call out the abnormalities as you see them. <laughs> All 
Hoda, Hoda <laughs> going with the uh, American College of Radiology term badness. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna play that one more time. And then, so what do you, what do you guys notice when you, when you look at this? Okay, so Natalie's saying there is definitely emphysematous changes. So there is uh, sort of uh, central emphysematous changes with some peripheral stuff as well. Ground glass, perfect. And where is the location of the ground glass? Right, so like, right, if we're looking at this image right here, it is uh, more peripheral involvement. So right, so you're seeing it sort of like what we call um, almost like subplural, sort of like around the outside of the lung beneath the pleural lining. And then finally, um, what do you notice about the bases? Great, it looks better. I would completely agree. So the weird thing is, right, this does not really match up at all with the chest x-ray we just looked at. So uh, this is just to kind of hammer home everything you guys just talked about as amateur radiologists. But here is the uh, coronal slices of his image, just to, just to show the distribution and where it is. So again, just highlighting this is upper lobe predominant ground glass in a sort of peripheral distribution. That is what the, the read that we all sort of came to, which is great. Okay, so I would propose that the two most striking features of this case right now are the fact that this person has uh, an upper lobe predominant lung disease and has peripheral eosinophilia. So what I want you guys to do is uh, take about a minute or two at your table. The farthest table, you guys are going to give me a differential for pulmonary eosinophilia, so diseases that cause pulmonary eosinophils. The middle table, you guys are going to tell me stuff that affects the upper lobes of the lung. And then pulmonary eosinophils on my table as well. And then we're going to come together and see what our overlap is. So take about two minutes to do that. All right, let's uh, let's come back. Uh, right, Anita, Anita's, Anita's throwing out stuff in the chat, which is great. Um, so we're gonna start. We're gonna start with the table that had uh, what causes upper lobe predominant lung disease. Just to set the stage, I proposed the question, and every resident at that table, with the exception of Bill and a couple students, uh, bolted. So this is gonna be it's gonna be Bill et al over there. Um, so, Bill, what is your what is your end students? What is your differential for upper lobe predominant lung disease? Oh, I I completely forgot what I even asked. Great. So, middle table, uh, upper lobe predominant lung disease.
That is pretty great. So this is, this is we, we've gotten in trouble a couple times with Dr. Connors is like acronyms, but this is the one that he's talked about a few times, his Aztecs acronym, which you guys basically just name. So A, S, T, E, C, and S. So uh, what is the A here? You guys hit the nail on the head. It's aspergillosis or ABPA. The S is silicosis here. The T is TB, E is EO, C is uh, CF or cystic fibrosis, and then the bottom S is sarcoidosis again. So you guys did a perfect job there naming those. Um, if you were going to try to be completely inclusive, here is a table of all things that cause upper low predominant lung disease. I can, I can like send the review article if anyone's interested, but um, you hit the nail on the head and sort of hit all of the key uh, diseases that you need to worry about. Great. So aspergillosis, silicosis, TB, EO, CF, and sarcoid. Uh, leading to the differential if all we knew was this, this gentleman had sort of a subacute uh, upper lung disease. Which brings us to the next question, which is uh, how do we reconcile his eosinophilia? So middle table, no, <laughs> this table. Uh, Natalie, what did you guys say for uh, and far table? Two tables. We'll start here and then we'll go to Bill. Uh, Natalie, what did you guys say? That's malignancy as well. Perfect. That's a very, very good start. And then Bill's table, which is now sans Bill. Uh, <laughs> did you, did the uh, students over there, William and Bethany, nailed at that time? Uh, <laughs> I haven't got any names right for a while. Uh, what did you guys think of in addition to that? Oh. Amazing. I like it. That is awesome. So uh, I came up with something which is basically exactly what you guys came up with. So here was my approach to uh, pulmonary eosinophilia. So you guys basically hit all hit the nail on the head. So helmets, so helmet infections, right? Like strongyloides, ascariasis, hookworm, uh, paragonomyosis, so good travel history, TB and fungal, uh, coxy, and then TB in particular. Drugs and toxins is the big next category. So uh, what drugs and toxins cause pulmonary eosinophilia? Azacytidine. That was not the first answer I expected, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, so NSAIDs or salicylates can do it. Say louder. Uh, and a Antibiotics can so like DAPTO is a pretty is a pretty common like test question answer, um, but there are a ton of medicines. So essentially, anything that causes dress uh, or really any drug has been associated with uh, eosinophilic uh, pulmonary stuff. Vasculitis, uh, Mandy, what was the disease for that? Yeah, EGPA. I'm not sure if Chert or Strauss was a Nazi. So EG, EGPA, so eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. And then uh, within hypersensitivity, um, this is where you guys talked about ABPA, you talked about HP, and then asthma with like eosinophilic features. Um, and so those are like the big categories. And then there's this bottom category, which everyone talked about, which is like pneumonia in quotes, because it's not an infectious organism, but we call it a pneumonia. So how are we going to like figure out where in this picture this gentleman ends up? Bill's miming, not going with the mime. Megan, what do you want to what do you want to do, or who do you want to call? Great, you call poem for a bronc. Poem says, please rule out TB. Uh, <laughs> the, you rule out TB with three negative AFBs, and then you do a bronc. So the bronc uh, comes back, and you get these uh, results on your BAL. So uh, everyone take like thirty seconds, and I want just someone to call out what is the markedly abnormal BAL study here. What is, 
So I guess like, what is, is there anything that you kind of put out? All right. So this man, Corey's bringing up some good points here. This man has all the EOs in his lung. Every EO in his body is located in his lung. Um, so what is a normal amount of eosinophils in a BAL? Yeah, and he says zero. So it's like less than one is a normal amount. So 74 is about as high as I've ever seen. Um, and so what should this gentleman's BAL look like? Like what should be the predominant cell type if he's a non-smoker? So it should be this one. So it should be macrophages or large mononuclear. That number should be like in the 70s and he is in 16. So basically the predominant cell in his lung right now is an EO. The second most common is a macrophage. So he has an eosinophilic BAL. Um, does anyone have a way they think about eosinophils in the BAL? If anyone says yes, I will be amazed. <laughs> Not super common. Uh, but Corey brought up a good point. Corey, what was your, what were you just talking about? Yeah, so um, one of the differentials is like, when you're talking about hypersensitivity, you know, I just have a thought about trying to think of like the EOs are elevated and the BAL hypersensitivity more or less, but that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, so you guys were thinking like, was this hypersensitivity pneumonitis to begin with? And then you asked the question, is this, uh, I don't know if I have that in, I I had it. I don't have it. Okay, so you're asking the question like, was this hypersensitive pneumonitis? And this tells you that it is not because hypersensitive pneumonitis should have more lymphocytes. So in HP, your lymphocyte count should be really greater than about 20%. And so this man does not have hypersensitivity pneumonitis based on his BAL. He has a ton of eosinophils, um, which points us down um, this pathway right here, the uh, pneumonia pathway. And so anytime you see EOs that high, you're essentially dealing with either an acute or a chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Those are like the only two things that cause you to have that many EOs. So to, uh, venture some guesses here. Do you guys think this is an acute or a chronic eosinophilic pneumonia? Who votes in the room for acute? Bill votes one for acute, I like it. And who votes chronic? Uh, the remainder of the room threw Bill under the bus, <laughs> backed over it. Okay, um, so this gentleman, uh, let's figure it out. So when you're thinking about acute versus chronic, you need to go down sort of like thinking about basically like six key things, which is the who, there's a historical clue, what's the time course, do they have blood EOs, what's their imaging look like, and then what's their BAL look like. And between these like six things, you can differentiate. So the who for chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, this is gonna be usually people like in their 30s to 40s, and it's gonna be mostly women from historical stuff. For acute disease, unfortunately, like it doesn't really help you. It kind of carries over. Um, there's, no, uh, there's no gender predominance, but it's gonna be basically the same age group. Younger people tend to predominate. Does anyone know what the historical clue is for chronic eosinophilic pneumonia? Like what associated condition or thing they'll say? Maybe you might've just said it. Like both of them will asthma. Yeah, asthma. So for chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, like roughly 50% of people are going to have asthma. And so that's the historical clue there. Yeah. Or like Anita said, a history of A to, uh, a to B, I think is how you say it. I'm not entirely sure. Atopy. 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 It's the European pronunciation. Uh, does anyone know what the historical clue is for acute eosinophilic pneumonia? What they'll tell you they recently started doing. So this is when they're gonna tell you that they started smoking. So people will say they started smoking recently and then they felt really, really bad. So time course, uh, this is gonna be chronic, like the name says, so that's gonna be months. Acute, right, name, it's gonna be acute, it's gonna be fulminant, it's gonna be days or so. Blood EOs are gonna be higher in chronic. They might be elevated in acute, but they're gonna be definitely higher in chronic. And then on imaging, you're gonna see something called a photonegative pulmonary edema. That is sort of like the key uh, phrase. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Acute is probably going to look more like ARDS. It's going to be diffuse. It's going to be in all lobes. And then when you get to the BAL, they're both going to have greater than 20% EOs. So that does not really help you differentiate. And so really this whole diagnosis comes down to what's their historical clue, what's their time course, and what's their imaging look like. And so based on that, uh, this gentleman per palm fell into this chronic category. So has anyone ever, uh, has anyone had a patient with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia before? Bill, what was that person's uh, case like? Yeah. 
Christ. <laughs> Bill uh, threw me under the bus after I made fun of him. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I've actually never seen this myself until this patient, um, but this disease has been around for a hot minute. And so taking a quick historical trip to talk about some stuff here. So this disease was first described in 1969 by this guy Carrington in New England Journal. He essentially uh, found nine women who had a similar clinical picture. Uh, the left was their uh, pathology slide. So you see a bunch of EOs and macrophages and the right was their imaging. And so what do you guys notice? I'll tell you that this is the, uh, these are the x-rays on admit. What do you guys notice about the admit x-rays compared to, um, let's say your typical person who has like cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Yeah, so the is crushing it. So there's a peripheral predominance. And so this is called like the photo negative of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So where cardiogenic pulmonary edema would affect this area uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia affects the outer edges of the radiograph. And so this is like really a uh, pretty characteristic. The other thing that they've called it is like a reverse bat wing. So we had a person with PJP earlier this month. Uh, that's a really complicated description, but essentially if you imagine a bat wing, that's not where the infiltrates are. <laughs> they are outside the bat wing. So uh, not, not super helpful. Um, but this, this paper was the, the first time that someone actually described the uh, photo negative appearance. So he said, you know, the pulmonary infiltrates are a photographic negative or reversal of the shadow seen in pulmonary edema or alveolar prognosis. Uh, and like Nita said, it's really a peripheral distribution. Um, so what did our patient's path look like? So I called the pathology department this morning to see if they had pictures available and they did. And so um, this is what our person's pathology looked like. Uh, I am not a pathologist. So I will just tell you that uh, I asked the pathologist like, hey, what's, what's up? And he said, there are a lot of eosinophils and a lot of macrophages. So my best guess is that a lot of the purple dots you're seeing are pulmonary eosinophils, uh, admixed with some macrophages. Uh, Corey took a look at the picture for the first time and uh, he's also a pathologist. So I, uh, I am incorrect. So I guess Corey points out, those are eosinophils. <laughs> Uh, those are eosinophils, and then everything else that's purple is a macrophage. So I had it reversed. So Corey one me zero. So this gentleman uh, diagnosed with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, and then the next question is, how do we treat him? Um, so just to summarize, the uh, pulmonary rex. They said, you know, he has 74% EOs, classic predominance. He's COVID negative, which uh, now we know that COVID could cause similar infiltrate. So he was ruled out for that twice. Uh, he had negative ANCAs, he had negative IgE, he had negative aspergillus antigens, ruling out ABPA and uh, uh, EGPA. So they started him on a uh, absolutely heroic dose of methylpred and then put him on PRED 0.5, um, which comes out to 60 daily, and he was discharged on a 60-day supply. So, right, so this is a pretty steroid responsive condition, so you can expect that over time he will likely improve, but there are some patients who can't be weaned off steroids, which is why it's super important that they also started uh, Bactrim uh, as well to make sure that we don't give this guy PJP and give him like the true bat wing. Uh, Bill also would like a PPIB ID, that's <laughs> what uh, Victor says. So yes, this gentleman was started on a PPI and uh, vitamin D supplementation as well. Um, uh, so yeah, so overall, um, just to zoom back out here, what did we talk about? This diagnosis was made via imaging and seeing eosinophils on the, bron on the uh, blood and bronchoscopy, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, and we talked about sort of a broader differential for this, looking at helminths, TB fungal, drugs, vasculitis, hypersensitivity, cancer, and then pneumonias in quotes. And that's it. That's all I got. Thanks, guys. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and have a great day.